Well, howdy there, folks. Uh, this is your host, ID Jester. Welcome back to Legions of War. Hopefully, you watched the uh, first part where we had the game overview and kind of discussion about Legions of War and the fact that I'm creating this game, trying to uh, build some interest for it. Hopefully, you've come here to watch more and find out more about this game. So, let's get right into it and start delving into some more of the specific details of how to play the game. So uh, last episode we talked about a high fantasy card game with strategic and tactical warfare between the races. Of course the goal of the game is to be the first player to capture three locations by using your units, items, and skills to outwit and outplay your opponents. You're going to be choosing a race and four units of that race to bring to the table. So I thought what we probably should do since we looked at uh, some of the different races and some of the different units, we talked about how you're going to be building your deck. Uh, there is no deck management other than you're going to be selecting different units to bring to the table each time. These are already preset uh, decks, so you don't have to worry about any kind of manipulation, deck management, or anything like that. So. Ah, without further ado, let's delve into diagnosing a unit card index. So when you actually see the cards, when you see them, uh, when I'm talking about them, you understand what we're talking about. So here you've got a description of a couple of the <coughs> units here. So let's look at a card. Look at this one on the left-hand side first. Up at the top, very top here, you can see the kingdom. So that shows the race that this belongs to. So all of your cards in your deck will have the kingdom in them. So it doesn't matter if you choose a knight or you choose a priest or a monk, wizard, rogues, clerics, whatever you will have up at the top. You can quickly and easily see that it says the kingdom. So all of them will be from the same race. But underneath that you can see where it says knight that is our actual unit type. So this way, after the game is over, you can quickly and easily sort your cards back out. You get all the knight cards together, and that will reform that deck. In the top left-hand corner, you can see a symbol here. That is the attack type. The attack type. So let's talk specifically about the attack type. So there are basically two different attack types. There is melee, which is a one adjacent space, and there is range, which is going to be two spaces in either direction. So obviously if you're doing melee, you're right up uh, next to somebody, you're swinging your sword, stabbing them with your axe, whatever, um, you're going to have to be adjacent to them to actually hit them with a melee attack. Uh, ranged again, you're going to be two spaces away. You cannot hit someone that's one space away. I should mention that again, all of this, uh, the rules, everything we're talking about, uh, are subject to being changed, altered, or whatever. And not only that, but all of the rules in the game, every rule that we're talking about, can and will be specifically broken by a unit. So when we talk about a melee unit, uh, you can only attack one adjacent space. We're going to see here in a little bit, one of these units actually breaks that rule. So you can't say, well, that's not, you can't do that because, you know, the rule is melee one adjacent space. So just keep in mind that all of the things you see from here, I'm giving you the default rule that would be put in the rule book. But of course, everything can and will be broken by the unit cards so just keep that in mind so again on the top left hand corner is your attack type so again melee or range so uh, it's going to show you whether or not you're going to be attacking adjacent spaces or two spaces in either direction on the top right hand corner we're talking about the attack damage so this is how the enemy is being damaged and down here we have a little chart for that as well so the attack damage types, there are three different attack damage types, at least for right now there are. There is melee, 
there is ranged, and there is magic. So you can end up getting some different combinations where you can be shooting a ranged magic or a ranged ranged attack or maybe a melee attack that's magic. And the damage attack type is important because some enemies will be resistance or take less damage or if they're attacked by a melee attack damage type then they might get to react to it all kinds of different things so attack damage type this shows you what kind of damage is going to be either melee ranged or magic so a lot of times you're just going to end up having you know your melee melee and your ranged and your ranged or your melee and magic or your ranged and magic um, probably not going to have anything where you're going to be shooting ranged and doing melee damage unless there's some specific uh, unit that might do something like that so uh, just keep that in mind so that's your attack type and then over on the right hand side is your attack damage now on the left hand side up in the corner here is going to be a cube that represents obviously a dice so just keep that in mind it's a dice and the number inside the dice is basically how many dice you're going to roll so you can see that's your attack dice so in this case the knight is going to attack with five attack dice now how do we know if he hits or not that's the little number next to it and this shows you what it needs to roll on a dice for to actually hit the default is going to be four and higher will be an attack there will be some units that will be better that might only need a three or better and there will be units that are worse that will be a five or better so obviously the lower the number the better chance you have of hitting so four and higher is kind of the default so basically about half the time your dice should hit an enemy so and anytime they hit an enemy we call that a wound so when we talk about a wound that's basically taking damage to an enemy uh, in the top, uh, the right hand side over there, you can see the big heart. Everybody knows what that is. I probably don't even need to tell you. That's your life level. This is how many wounds you can take before you die. Ah, not actually. So that's where our first, we talked about this in the original episode, uh, episode number one. We're adding some many different kinds of um, unknowns to the game. So, in a normal card game, if I was to, say, attack from this card to this card, he does five attack damage, this guy's only got three life, so five beats three, so this guy's dead. Well, in my game, it's not quite so simple, my friends. No, sir. It's going to be a lot more interesting than that. So, when you attack with your attack dice, you're obviously going to wound, and then your wounds are going to... Uh, be taken off of your character so uh, let's say that somebody attacks this knight here on the left hand side and does three points worth of wounds so what we would do at that point is just take three little wound counters and obviously set them on top of the card so we know he has three wounds so what happens is before a unit activates before a unit activates uh, let me see here let's uh, let's go down here to the bottom here because this might show you uh, s some uh, an explanation of activating a unit here so this is kind of important I was going to save this for the next episode but I think it's important enough to uh, bring up right now so before a unit activates uh, there are uh, steps that you go through so before and activating a spot the card owner of that spot can play cards so for whatever reason I might have a card in my hand that says removed two wounds from an, uh, from a unit so I might play that card activate it and remove two wounds from this unit so there's lots of different things that can happen again bringing a lot of the unknown in because I'm going to have cards out on the table that are in play and then I'm going to have cards in my hands that can alter and change uh, the course of what's going to happen uh, on the playing field so 
first thing that will happen is uh, before activating is the, the spot the card owner can play cards so we'll look at that in the next episode specifically when we talk about how the actual process of the game happens uh, after that the other player then can play cards so maybe my opponent has a card that says um, if a enemy has three you know uh, let's just say um, Damage an enemy equal to the number of wounds it has. Well, my enemy, uh, my uh, knight here has three wounds. So if he plays that card on me, I would get three more wounds. So there we go. Ah, then, after all the cards have been played, then the first thing that's going to happen before you can activate a spot is you're going to roll for a death saving throw. So let's go back to our original example here. What exactly is a death saving throw? Bringing in some more of the unknown. Is this knight going to activate? So before I can actually activate it to do anything, it has two life levels, but he's taken three wounds. Uh, a unit doesn't die. Here's the rule. The unit doesn't die until it fails a death saving throw. A death saving throw is basically a six-sided dice that you roll, and if you roll equal to or less on the dice, then what your uh, minus in hit points, then you die. So you can see we've taken three wounds. We only had two life, so we're at minus one wound. So in this case, I would roll a six-sided dice. On a one, the knight dies. He's gone. Pfft, out of the game. Remove him from the playing field. If I roll a 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, then I'm fine, and I can then activate the unit. So I actually have, where is it? Bloop. Over here. Let's bring it onto there. So let's we'll just assume that this is the situation. I'm going to activate my knight. I have two um, life. I've taken three wounds. I need to make a death saving throw before I can do anything else after both players play cards. Again, if I had cards, maybe I could get him, uh, you know, I might have a card that says transfer one wound from this, uh, from one unit to another unit. So I might say, oh, you know what, I'm going to play that card and activate this. In this case, I do not need to make a death saving throw because I am not in the negative. My wounds are not in the negative, so I do not need to make a death saving throw. So I know I will be able to activate this unit and be able to do whatever I can do for my activation. Let's assume I didn't have that ability though. Let's just assume that I have, uh, I have my um, three wounds. I need to make my death saving throw. So let's just roll here, Boop. roll the dice, and I got a three. So since I made my death saving throw, I can then continue and activate my unit. So if we scroll down back to the bottom here again. So again, first things happens uh, before activating a spot, card owner can play cards. Then after that, the other player can play cards. Then you're going to roll a death saving throw. And then you will activate the spot. And we're going to talk more about that exactly in the next episode. But I thought it was uh, important enough to bring up now to kind of explain how the unknown. Is this unit going to make it? Is it not? I could actually have, let's just say I have something like this at this case. So I have two wounds. Of, uh, to have, I'm sorry. I have two life level. I've taken five wounds. So I'm at minus three. Uh, before I get to do anything, I can play cards. My opponent can play cards back and forth until we both pass. We bo let's assume we both pass. Nobody plays any cards. I then have to make a death saving throw before I can do anything. And I would roll the dice, and on a 1, 2, or 3, this unit would die. And in this case, I did roll a 2, so the unit would die. Fortunately for the knight, the knight, if we actually move these units down to the bottom here, actually, I'm just, yeah, that's fine. I'll just leave them down here in the bottom, stack them up down here. Uh, you can see the knight has a specific ability for the king. When a knight fails a death saving throw, they can reroll it one time. So uh, I would get to reroll my death saving throw since I failed it. I would reroll, 
And I rolled a three, and I still die, because I have taken five, oop, in this case I have six wounds, uh, and I only have two lives, so the knight would be dead, and even though he got uh, for the king a uh, saving throw. So that's how that works. You're never sure. You might have five wounds on the enemy, and they could keep rolling sixes and stay in the fight forever until you wound them again. Obviously, when somebody's at minus six wounds, they probably are going to die unless, of course, you've got some kind of a ability or something like that that's going to help you out. So, speaking of abilities, let's just move these out of the way again so you guys can see the rest of this info. So underneath our life level and underneath our attack dice is what I call the unit defined ability. That means this ability for the king is on every knight card. So all knights are created equal. They all have for the king. So when a knight fails the death saving throw, they can reroll at one time. So that is going to be the top power is the unit defined ability. Underneath that, we have the special unit ability. Special unit ability? What's that? Well, not all knights are created equal. When you choose the knight class to add to the deck, you're going to get many variations of knights. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But each one is, you're going to have a specific unit ability. So. Once you know the knight's user defined ability, which is pretty easy, um, you're going to know that. Once you play a few knights, you're going to remember, oh, my knight, he gets to reroll death saving throws. Uh, I would say um, you're going to come, you're, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Anyways, this one here actually is armored. So each rolled one on an opponent's attack dice blocks one wound. So let's say, for example, I have an enemy that's attacking him with, um, let's see here, let's go with the 5d6 and uh, we'll just do that. And we'll just assume he, uh, they're hitting on fours and higher. So he rolled a six and a six. So you can see he did two wounds, but because this one is armored, he rolled one on an opponent's attack dice, blocks a wound. So in this case, one of this one will block this one six, this one wound. So instead of taking two wounds, I would only take one wound on this knight specifically. If we look at this knight, uh, you will notice there's some more stat lines over here that some of them, um, just because you choose a specific class, not all of the uh, knights or all of the monks or all of the orcs or goblins or whatever it is are created equal. They are going to be different. Some of them will have same or different attacks. And you can see here, um, this one here, this knight has a melee attack type and a melee damage type. This knight also has a melee attack type and a melee attack uh, damage, but they could be different. They may have the same or different stats. In fact, you can see this one here. It only has four dice, but it has three life. So this guy is a little bit tougher, but doesn't quite attack just as well. And of course, they can have different, um, different wounding uh, ability on the attack dice. So in this case, the original knight had a four plus, and this one has a four plus as well. You will notice though that um, there are different units, but they will all have the same defined ability. All knights will have the same defined ability, and even though they will be different, um, maybe have different stats, maybe have different kinds of attacks, and of course, different special unit abilities. You can see this knight here has lances, which means it can attack an opponent that is up to two spaces for the knight, which breaks the rule we talked about over here, which uh, melee, you can only attack one adjacent space. And uh, with this knight here, you could actually attack up to two spaces away with a melee attack because of the lances. And then following down here in the bottom, 
you're going to have the card type, which is either going to be a unit, an item, or a skill. Uh, skills don't necessarily have to mean just skills, but also like spells and spell-like abilities and things like that. They're just all thrown into one category called skills. I didn't want to call that category spells because then people might go, well, this really isn't a spell. Well, wow, that's, you know, and kind of make people not understand. So the actual different kinds are units, items, and skills. And again, think of skills as skill, skill, spell-like abilities, spells, uh, different powers, and different abilities that characters have. Obviously, we looked at units and we looked at items. All right, so over here on the right-hand side, down here at the bottom, you're going to see where we have a breakdown of a card set. So we have 12 cards in each card set, 12 cards total. There's going to be probably, uh, by default, five to seven unit cards in each card set. There's going to be one to three item cards in a card set, and there's going to be one to three skill cards in a card set. That's kind of the normal. You might come across a few of the different creatures that have different setups, but for the most part, about 50 to 70% are going to be units. Um, 10 to 30 percent are going to be item cards and 10 to 30 percent are going to be skill cards. So it might break down as um, a 6-2-2 two, two, or it could be a 7-1-2 or it could be a 7-2-1 or whatever. And then of course you're going to have exactly 10 location, I'm sorry, exactly two location cards. So you're going to have a total of 10 unit, item, and skill cards and two total location cards. So that's the breakdown of, of a unit card. Let's look specifically at, that's right, some skills and some items. So in the skills and the items, uh, we'll talk about the item card over here on the left hand side first. Up here at the top, obviously we talked about this. This is the race, the kingdom, then it's the uh, card name, so in this case it's the Holy Sword. And of course, beneath that, it's from which set it comes from. So it comes from the Knight set. So again, easy to uh, sort your cards at the end. You're just looking for all the Knight cards, put them in a pile. Uh, but of course, your, all your cards should have the Kingdom at the top, if that was your chosen race. If an item card actually gives you any kind of attack, it will show you here. So if you were to put this on a ranged character, they would have a ranged ability and they would also have a melee ability. So sometimes uh, cards may or may not give you an attack type and an attack damage. It might switch your attack damage. It might switch your attack type. Uh, so you have to look up here in the top corner. All unit, I'm sorry, all item cards are going to be specifically the same way with a any unit ability at the top, which means you can apply this ability to any unit that's on the board that's an ally. <coughs> so that means there are no wasted or useless cards. So you can apply this to any single unit that you have. So you can see here for the Holy Sword, if we had this attached to our knight, or anybody, um, let's just say we attached him to the uh, uh, wizard, when a six is rolled during an attack, this unit heals one wound. So specifically, when a six is rolled, it doesn't matter, he rolls six sixes, it doesn't matter, you're going to heal one wound. At the bottom of a item card is going to have the class item specific um, class unit item uh, and that's going to fall under whatever uh, card set this belongs to is also the class unit type so for example here in the knight category if we play this card on a knight obviously it's going to give us a better bonus than when we just played on anything if we just played on a, a rogue or a cleric or a monk or whatever it's going to give us a nice boost, but if we can play this, if we can hold it and wait and play it on the on the proper character, it's going to give us a special bonus. And you can see here, 
uh, it's blessed servant if this weapon is given to a knight for each rolled six during its attack the knight heals one wound so you can see a big difference uh, in the um, if you can um, give it to uh, the actual unit that it belongs to same thing over here on the right hand side for skills again skills can be skill like abilities spells spell like abilities all kinds of different things it's going to have it at the very top it's going to have your race it's going to have the name of the card and then it's going to have which class it's from again this is from the knight class so if we can play this card on the knight we're going to get a better bonus uh, and most of the skills in or items might have a timing on when you can play the card that'll be listed here at the top so you can see play this card before activating an ally unit so this would be again before we activated that unit when we were playing cards uh, before we roll the death saving throw we would play this card before activating an ally unit again same setup as we had with the items up here at the top is in any unit any unit we give this to skill so song of hope obviously named after the card we're going to choose an ally unit that unit and any adjacent ally units heal one wound and then down at the bottom again we have a specific card set belonging to again we're going to look at the knight so obviously if we can play this on the knight we're going to get a little bit better in the bonus and that's the class unit skill inspiring hope if one of the units chosen is a knight then all units heal two wounds so you can see big bonus if we can wait to hold on to this card and get it on the specific unit so all cards in the game all items and skills are going to have the same setup where you're going to have a uh, uh, ability that works with anything anybody you can put it on and then obviously uh, one for the specific unit set that it came out of uh, so it gives you uh, some some great combo effects for um, you can combo your cards uh, for better effects which gives you some tactical and strategic decisions to make because do you save the card for later use waiting to get I mean if I hold this in my hand and I wait and wait and wait I might never get a night guard to come up or you know it might be the wrong time for the night to be played or whatever so do I hold this card or do I spend it and give it to just another unit and hoping to get the jump on my opponent so it brings in some more um, strategy and decision making that uh, players are going to have to use to kind of outwit and outthink their opponents so they can claim those prized locations so that's a look at our uh, item cards our skill cards and of course our unit cards a breakdown of what they look like uh, obviously we're talking uh, <laughs> alpha uh, early early um, stages of development here on the graphics obviously and all of that so the mechanics breakdown of a unit card a uh, item card and a skill card uh, hopefully I covered everything for everyone again before you activate a spot card owner can play cards so that's when we could play this card play a card before activating an ally unit so in spot number one here oops spot number one that's when we would play the song of hope by just uh, using the timing on the playing card then it can uh, just the items and the skills will work obviously on any single unit so it's a decision of which unit to place it on sometimes it's a, a situation where you think you know placing a certain skill or item on a character is going to help keep it alive is it uh, important enough to try and keep that character alive is it better played on the actual unit the card belongs to the class of the unit uh, but it also makes all of the cards very important and no cards are wasted or useless you can use them on anything so hopefully you enjoyed that 
again guys if you're interested in uh, learning about this game be sure to watch for some more videos to come and most importantly and I can't stress this enough obviously the only way this is ever going to make it anywhere is for us to get a lot of interest in the game for us to get a lot of feedback to get um, a lot of people interested to let the de game uh, development houses out there the publishers of the games let them know that you're interested in this game if they you know are they interested in publishing it um, send them a link to the um, videos on my YouTube channel uh, you know email them email your friends post on the forums uh, do whatever you can if you're interested in getting this game off the ground and get it running so we'll uh, like I said in the first episode we'll probably create three or four videos describing how the game uh, goes the different mechanics in the game uh, talk about um, so you know some specifics on how the game plays and get you guys a real good idea uh, if it's something that you guys would be interested in uh, backing or following and interested in getting uh, developed so thanks so much for all of your support and be sure to leave your thoughts comments suggestions below and we'll see you in the next episode